perfect started right so again welcome everybody to our masterclass session today uh we've got megan again joining us from the fine group but i think maybe before we do go ahead and start just a few um things to note please note that megan will be sharing um a survey in the session itself and the survey is just for us to be able to cater and make sure that the next sessions actually speak to what you actually need in terms of um, training um, and other things that you may need. So please, when she does share the survey, please, can you try and fill it in? Um, last session, we had quite a lot of people on the call, but less than 10 people filled in our survey, guys. So please, if you can, those surveys really help us in terms of doing research around what we need training on, how can we help with capacity building within our NGOs. So please, when you do get a chance, please do fill that in once you drops it on the call itself. And then just another reminder, please, to just please remember to mute yourselves um, when you aren't speaking. So if you ha don't have any questions, well, if Megan hasn't asked any questions, uh, just remember to mute yourselves because it does kind of interrupt the flow of the person who is presenting. Um, so just a reminder on all of those. And then also, um, we will be sharing the session again post this. So maybe if there's questions that might come up after the session, please feel free to reach out to us again. Um, we will be able to assist you because we will be sharing the recording as well. So you can also watch this post the session. But I don't want to take away any of, of Megan's time anymore. Um, Megs, I don't know if you want to go ahead. So Megan will just do a quick intro and run through a bit of what we went through last time in case you'd missed it. Maybe you had prior commitments and then she'll start the session. Megs, please go ahead. Thank you so much. So good morning, everybody. So lovely to be with those of you that joined us last week again. Um, and if you're new to the room, hello and lovely to meet you. Um, my name is Megan Nethercutt and I work with an organization for an organization called Find for Good. And Find for Good is essentially a marketing and communication specialist. We come out of the healthcare space originally, but spend a lot of our time, all of our time actually, thinking about how to build brands for good. Um, your organizations are doing incredible work in this world and we yep. have a firm belief that NGOs and those organizations working for good in this world have the all the ingredients to become some of the world's biggest brands. Um, and, and we are on a journey working with some of them in a consulting capacity mm -hmm. and sharing more broadly with you today in these types of forums, some of the, the tips, the tricks, the learnings, the methodologies, all the thinking work that we have accumulated over the 25 years that mm -hmm. FINE has been in operation. Um, and as we're doing today, we're sharing it with, sharing it with you in various modules, um, Branding is really a discipline and it's called the discipline of branding for a reason. Um, there are many guidelines and there are many methodologies and tools that you can follow. In a forum like this, it is sometimes tricky to get interactive, to have as much conversation as we'd like. Brands are often built by rolling up our sleeves and getting into workshops. So I acknowledge that from a content perspective, um, we're going to start the process today. We could deep dive a whole lot more and we could do a whole lot more work together. But the intention for these hour or so um, sessions that we spend together is really just start you on that journey of building your own brand and giving you as many practical tools and tricks as possible. So I'll ask those that were with us last week just to bear with us. It'll be very short and sharp, but I just do want to take us back to where we went in module one, just to try and get everyone on the same page. And I think last last time we met and the recording is available for anyone who wants it, we really started with this idea of what, what is a brand, what is the role of, of a brand in an organization, and importantly, how can it grow your your, your organization. That's what we all want. Whether you're in the for good space, whether you're in the corporate space, you want growth. Growth looks a bit different. Growth isn't feet through a door or app downloads in the for good space. It's often funding, but you still want growth. You still want to be able to serve those beneficiaries, those stakeholders better um, and in a more meaningful way. So that's really what brands do. 
Um, for those of you that remember, um, very, very simple methodology that we use. Um, we believe that ultimately brands get people to trust in our organizations more. So if we don't want to use the word brand again, I'm absolutely fine with that. You can chuck it out the window, but let's talk about trust. Let's talk about how we build trust in the organizations that we work with and for. And very simply, trust from a brand perspective, if those of you that were with us last time remember, mm -hmm. has two essential components. One, it's just this about this, uh, this idea of reliability, that we have to say the same things in the same way. We have to show up in a very certain way to the market each and every time for people to start to trust us. Um, Brands can be a little bit schizophrenic and all over the place if people don't understand the tone that we use, the messaging that we give. So reliability and consistency is really the first point of call from a brand discipline perspective. But then you've got to add a bit of spice. Then you've got to add the delight component. So a lot of these methodologies that we'll take you through is navigating this journey of how do we get consistency? How do we say the same things in the same way? But then how do you add that delight component and how do you make sure that you're doing it differently to everyone else um, in a more memorable way, in a unique way? And therein lies this dance or this discipline of branding. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the detail of kind of the reliability and delight pieces, but I do just want to take us back because it's really, really critical um, and it can be the launch pad for what we're going to talk today was this idea of a single minded message. Um, those of you that were in the session last time, remember that we had this idea that even though brands can be very, very complex, they say many things, our stories and our offerings can be hugely complex and then we could write a thesis on them. A, a single principle in marketing or branding is that often all we have is the space of one billboard, one tagline, a very short, sharp statement to summarize and articulate everything that we do. It's incredibly tricky, but it's a really, really powerful tool if we can start to harness and distill everything down into this one statement. Um, so I want to take us back to that idea of a single-minded message, and I want to implant it again in your kind of minds that um, those of you that were with us last time, I hope you've been thinking about it. I hope you've been refining it. Um, and those of you that are hearing about it for the first time today, I would urge you to think um, think of yourself as having bought the biggest, most wonderful billboard that's going to get you the most exposure. But you've got the real estate of that billboard to tell the world what you do. Um, billboard best practice is eight words or less. So I will give you the challenge. We won't do it again today, but I'll give you the challenge that if we were to write down and articulate what your organization does in eight words or less, um, could you do it? Uh, I went through the tennis ball example. For those of you that remember, very short and in a summarized way. We cannot throw too many messages at our audience um, and expect them to catch them. We have to be very disciplined and understand what are those key things that we want the market to know, how do we want to structure them, and then offer them up to the market in a very single-minded way. Um, for those of you who were last um, here last time, you know that this clip didn't play effectively, but I think it is, it's an oldie, an oldie but a goodie. I've got two oldies but goodies to share with you today, but I want you to, to watch this ad. It's an ad for a bank. You can have your own opinions about the bank in question, but see, see how they have managed to get a very, very clear single-minded message, even though they're telling us about all sorts of complicated stuff like syndicated loans and number of ATMs. So have a look and see how they've done it. What is this about big? You know, seeing the big picture, having the big idea, clinching the big deal. Nobody wants to clinch the little deal. Who wants to do that? Be a little deal clincher, a small shot. You know, when you go and get a burger, you want a Big Mac. You go to the fun fair, you ride the Big Dipper. You turn on TV and you see Big Bird, or you're afraid of the Big Bad Wolf. When I was growing up, I wanted to be the big man. I never wanted to be the little man. Even the little man wanted to be the big man. You go to America, you want to go to the Big Apple, not the Little Apple. I get up in the morning, I want a big breakfast. I want my girlfriend to say, good morning, big boy, to which I'll reply, I've got a big day today, a big meeting with the big cheese from a big studio. It's a big time for the big bucks. And she'll turn to me, rolling up big blue eyes and say, big head. I'll retort, what's the big deal? Give her a big kiss. 
I'll get into my big car, set up for the big wide world. She'll give me a big wave, close the door of our big house, look in the mirror and ask herself, does my bum look big in this? In my big meeting, I'll turn to one of the big hitters and I'll say, I love this movie, it's got to be big. And there's only one small problem, my fee. I'd like it to be, um, what's the word? Okay, so a big world needs a big bank and they managed to sneak a whole lot of reference points under that. So obviously, um, our single-minded messages might look and feel very different, but what is that one thing that we can differentiate ourselves within the market? Um, really interesting and key branding principle. So I won't belabor that point, but if you want to have some fun, um, if you want a kind of a team activity in your next uh, leadership meeting or in your project teams, give everyone a billboard, give everyone a blank piece of paper and say, guys, can we articulate what we do in eight words or less? And just see as a fun exercise what comes out and, and, and how you can kind of create consistency around some of the language and the messaging you use. So that's the whistle stop tour of last week. I won't belabor any of those points, but if there are questions, um, if there was anyone that was in the last session that's been thinking thoughts or has any questions, please pop, pop them on the chat. Um, we may not address them in the session today, but I'll certainly answer you after the after the fact. So um if we if we take single minded message as our point of departure, it's critical, it's important, um, but we do understand that we have to flesh this out a little bit more. We can't just crack our one line, a single statement and think that we are we are well on the road to building a brand or, or building our brand story. So what I wanted to do today was just push a little bit further into this idea of a brand story and and talk about some of the principles and some of the methodologies that we can use to help tell a consistent story across our stakeholders. Um, so often what we do as branders, and when we do this all the time, we jump straight into what we want to say, right? So we get ourselves going, we understand the road we're on, and we start, we start articulating what we do. What do we do? How do we do it? But I want to pause for a moment and I want to ask the question of everyone um, just around brand tone. And, and by tone, what I'm really saying is brands show up in a certain way in the market, in how they speak, in their personalities. So there's no logo on this page, um, but maybe if you want to pop it in the chat, but I'm pretty sure you could tell me who this brand is, um, very well-known brand in the South African market. Um, and they've got a very, very distinct way of talking. They've got a cheekiness um, and they use that as their brand superpower, as the thing that makes them different. Whenever there's a scandal happening in our country, we all say, oh, come on, what's Nando's gonna say to this? They've turned it in a way to create brand awareness. So again, I'm not saying we all need to be the um, the jester, the court jester as Nando's is, but think about the how, how you show up in the market before you get into just what you're saying. Um, again, another South African brand, very well known, um, they are well known for their thought leadership, for this kind of behavioral science, for being the intellectual in the room. That ability allowed them to go from selling health insurance or medical aid to becoming a bank. Um, did we know 10 years ago that we were going to have a, a kind of a credit card from Discovery? I sure didn't. But the the way they showed up and their ability to say we we are at the cutting edge of thinking allowed them to translate from healthcare into banking. So okay, fabulous, wonderful. Um there are lots and lots and lots of examples of brand tonality and brands sticking to who they are in the market, not only what they want to say. Mr. Price, another beautiful example all about fashion, all about hip and funky, but there is always that undertone of value. So, so being affordable. And the principle, again, this is around starting understanding some of the methodologies and principle, the principles that brands are using 
um, when they think about their brand tone is this idea of a brand archetype. So archetypes are not only used in branding, we get them all over. Um, but again, if you'd like to just go and Google, there's a million articles and a million references to this. But my question to you today is before you jump into what you want to say from a brand perspective, um, think think about that your your brand tonality and how your brand shows up in the market. Um, this archetype wheel sort of allows us to take some of the key personality traits um, that actually stem from a human space and associate them with brands. If we think kind of in that top left quadrant, you've got your service control innovation. If I want to stand for those things, I'm going to look and sound a certain way. If I want to stand for safety, knowledge, freedom, um, a kind of more spiritual realm, I'm going to look and sound a certain way. And, the, and we go across the wheel. So again, we're not saying that any of this is copy paste. We're not saying that um, that it's an exact science. But I suppose my question to you today, and we're not going to pause and answer it, but, um, I'm just going to put it out there, is what is your brand tone? And have you thought about how you show up in the market? Um, are you the thought leader in your space? Um, if you believe that you are the thought leader, how are you communicating? Are you using data? Are you using evidence to show how your programs are more efficient, are more um, have kind of better improved outcomes? If you are the caregiver, um, which a lot of people, I think, and a lot of organizations in the NGO space um, uh, aspire to be, how are you using the language of a caregiver? How are you infusing that service language into everything you do? So it's not just about what you say, but it's the angle or the tone or the the viewpoint from which you come from that brand, uh, branding individuals like me spend a lot of time thinking about because it helps us give a structure to the type of language um, and the type of content that we produce. Um, we know that language matters, and and I think other than just thinking through the rational components of what your offering is, what your programs do, think about the voice that you want to use, um, and and infuse that into your communications. Again, as always, it's never a, as easy as looking at our own house and getting our own house in order. What's also critical is we have to understand what other people in the market are saying. And the next branding principle that we spend a huge amount of time researching and gaining insight to is what we would call what our competitors are saying. I don't like to use the word competitor in a for good space because I think that we are all essentially working for good. But let's say your partners, your your um, colleagues, your partner organizations in the category that you're playing in, what are they saying? Um, Again, put yourself in the seat of the funder or the individual who is getting um, communicated to. They are getting lots of pieces of communication from many, many spaces and places in their world. Um, have we done an audit, and we do call it an audit or a competitor analysis of what everyone else is saying in your category? Um, because a big part of branding is we either need to be different, we either need to say something different, or we need to do it better. And by better, I just mean find an angle that's unique, find an angle that's memorable. So there's all sorts of models and all sorts of way of doing this out there, but you can start very, very, very simply. Um, go and look and go and do an assessment of who the competitors are in your space or the, the, the partner organizations in your space and methodically go and look through if you can find their equivalent of a key message, single-minded message, tagline, sometimes we call it, what is the thing that they keep saying to the market? Um, and can you find in any publicly available sources a summary of their offering? What is it that they say they're doing? And what language do they use? How, how are they saying it? 
And then I think interesting is often what we do just on a single page and you can put it on a PowerPoint slide um, and just go and take screenshots, just go and take um, some things that you can find off the internet or publicly available sources. You don't need to kind of um, get into anything that's not publicly available, but go and look at their communication. What imagery are they using? Um, how, how, what, what do those images say about that organization? And I think if you start to put those three things on a page, very, very simply, you can even write it out, um, doesn't even have to be, be digital, but just start doing an analysis and an audit of what those single-minded messages are, what they say they're saying to the to the their stakeholders or to the market, and what does it look like? That will give you more than enough of a base to start to say, all right, here's what everyone else is saying. Here's how it sounds. Here's how it looks. How can I take my offering or, or, or my single minded message, my brand tone and think about it in this context of a competitor and do it differently? Um, for the purpose of today, we're not going to be able to workshop each individuals because they will all they will all have a different answer. But just use that principle of not just thinking about our own house and getting our own house or organization in order. Think about that competitive landscape and think about what other people are saying. Um, and there will be ways. There will be ways to pull ourselves up and, and out of out of that kind of clutter of communication and sound and look different. Um, so that's a brief whistle stop tour of tone. I think the summary there is before we get into writing and before we get into putting anything on a page, think about how you want to show up to the market. Um, so that's step number one. Step number two is this elusive thing that we call a brand story, right? Um, again, you can go online. There are many, many ways to do this. Um, we have a firm belief that the simplest way is often the most elegant. And so the way that we start this process of structuring a brand story actually comes from a gentleman named Simon Sinek. I don't know if any of you have heard him. It's another, this, this idea is as old as the hills, but it's phenomenal and it works every time. Um, he, he states, and this is certainly not a fine invention, so all credit to Simon Sinek, but he states that if we want to start crafting a brand story, we need three components only. We need to know why we do what we do. We need to know how we do it and we need to know what we do, okay? Sounds incredibly simple, um, and it is. But the interesting thing that we often do is we don't start with the why, we start with the, the stuff that we can touch and feel and see and articulate. So everyone, hopefully, should be able to communicate what they do, right? Um, the problem is if we start there and end there, no one's going to listen to us because it doesn't differentiate us in any way and it doesn't connect um, at, a, at an emotional level. So I'm going to play a little video. He has a phenomenal TED talk. Um, it is a good couple of years old, but I would urge you all, I'm not going to um, play it for the purpose of, of today, but I would urge you all go and look for Simon Sinek. It's a TED talk. Um, it's called the Golden Circles. You can find it all over. You can find longer versions and short versions. But I'm going to just play you a minute or two of it today. Probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the Golden Circle. This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. By why, I mean, what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? And why should anyone care? The inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Nah. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales are done. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe, 
in challenging the status quo, we believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? People don't buy what you do. People buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. If you um, hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people who believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. Something called Okay. So again, very, very simple concept and construct, but what he, what he says is so powerful because we all, when we start writing this thing called a brand story and we want to get this hymn sheet or this guideline that everyone in our organization can follow, it's very, very easy to start in the what. Um, we're not discounting it. We're not saying that that shouldn't exist, but that should in essence be the easiest component to communicate. Um, what you do is the base of your programs, of your offering. Um, it's the tangible component of the service or the product. How you do it starts to get interesting because that's when we can start to think about things that make us different. What methodologies are you using? What, um, what tools do you have in place? What monitoring and evaluation um, are you putting in place that makes you different? How are you tracking outcomes, perhaps? I know everyone's organization is very different, um, but how? How is often where we can start to differentiate and we can say um, something different about ourselves compared to the market. But I think what's really interesting, and we see it often, even in this for good space, is that sometimes we forget to start with why. Why? What is the ultimate belief around why we are doing what we're doing? And again, I will urge us to go back to some of the learnings from the original session is the why is not articulating the problem statement. So if, for example, you were an organization working in, just take, for example, um, helping to solve youth unemployment, your why is not the unemployment statistics of the day or the size of the problem. Your why statement is your belief in why this how and what you do is going to shift that how you can be part of the solution, not the problem. So again, these are tricky things and these are all kind of quite intellectual constructs, but there's actually very easy ways to start, right? The way that we can start is to just, as we did in the last session, and this I am going to ask everyone to scribble it on a piece of paper, write it in the notes, um, jot it down on your cell phone notes, wherever you want to put it. But as we did with the billboard last time, this one I want to ask you, that if you started a sentence with either we, if you're thinking from a team mindset or um, as a kind of a founder or an owner or put your organization's name in the front, but tell me, start a sentence for me around that says, we believe that. And then tell me your why statements of your organization. Um, and I will pause for a moment there so that we can actually get some inputs in. And I'll ask those that are willing just to pop them in the chat for us so we can start to have a little bit of fun and see what comes out. So I think I'll pause for a moment or two there. I'm just going to take this off screen so I can see the chat. Hey, let's see who's got their thinking caps on. We believe that. I believe that. Our organization believes that.
Dokes. So Louise is saying, we believe that the children coming through our hands have a hope and future. I like that. Timothy, we believe every child is born unique. I believe all children are blessed. Innovation of Excellence believes every child is a genius. I love that. Any other thoughts? We believe in empowering young minds through mentorship. We believe, Neo says, we believe that we can change the narrative of young children and the youth by giving them educational tools and fulfill their true potential and become what they are destined to be. Love it. We believe that families can be empowered to stay together and thrive. I love that. So thank you to everyone who took a bash. Um, my question to you, and again, I know in this forum it may be um, challenging to, to answer, but I want to ask you how often when you communicate with a potential new donor, with um, a stakeholder, with a partner, um, how often do you start your communication with that belief statement? How often do you pause? Doesn't need It doesn't need 20 minutes, half an hour. It takes two minutes to start an interaction with why and then kind of get into the what. Um, I would urge you, if you're starting to use this principle of a brand story, is to put a put a discipline in place that every new interaction, every time you meet someone, um, start with the same sentence and say, hello, lovely to meet you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our organization today. We believe that. And practice that statement and get it consistent and get it flowing off the tongue um, and, and across the organization. And I think you'll be interested to see how, how quickly that shifts the tonality in the room so that people are all kind of on board with this, this statement of why you exist. Um, again, and I know hard to do today, but often what we do as leadership teams, um, as your project teams, whoever's in your organization, we actually physically sit around a table. Um, you don't need anything more than a, a blank piece of paper. And I would urge you to take that blank piece of paper and put it in four quadrants, right? Don't need fancy tools, don't need fancy software, but in those four quadrants, write yourself why, then write the word what, write the word how, and then often what we do at FINE is, um, whilst the golden circle talks about the why, what, and the how, a missing component often when we're selling our, our organization is who. So I would urge you in the, the bottom quadrant, or wherever you want, and it's um, I'm going old school here. Hopefully this, my camera is working with me. Um, it's four quadrants on a piece of paper. Why, what, how, who, that is all you need, whether you're the world's largest brand, whether you Apple, or whether you any of these organizations sitting around this virtual table today, that is the only structure that you're going to need to start telling a consistent brand story. Um, get that why statement right. Um, start your sentence with either we believe or I believe that. Um, then getting getting into the what, be able to articulate what you do in a really short, sharp, summarized way. Um, I would spend as much time as possible on the how. So whilst the what is important, unless you're planning on changing your model or extending into a new service or a new offering, the what is often the most easy to kind of get our heads around and articulate. What we don't spend enough time on is the how. how what is it? What is it about what you do? Um, and again, really hard to do in a forum like this, but is it is it as I've said before, you're monitoring and evaluation that you do better than anyone else, or you can provide a donor more insight, more, more comfort in that where their spend is going. Um, is it your reporting that you do um, more methodically than anyone else? Is there a really clever um, 
way that you approach, if it is around, and I'm just using the examples on the call today, um, empowering families that stay together. Have you got some kind of evidence-based model uh, or, or what are your case studies that show there's a certain way that you do it um, that potentially ensures um, kind of more favorable or more pr um, uh, positive outcomes? Very hard today in this type of forum for me to articulate all the different ways, but spend a lot of time in the how. So we get the why right, we understand the what, and we package it up in a nice, short, sharp way. We really, really focus on the how. And then the fourth component that I would urge you to do is look at the who. Because specifically, if we're talking about trust and, and building brands, the organization, the people in your organization or as much part of are as much part of your brand um, as any of these methodologies or any of the other statements that we've made. Um, I think that to profile the team members, profile their experience and, and give a, a human face to what you do is equally important. Um, so. Again, to keep it very, very practical, there are many ways, often people will say to us, we just need a consistent brochure. We just need a consistent company profile that we can show up and we can say the same thing and we can articulate who we are. I'm saying to you today that I, I work on brands in the for good space and in the profit sector. And regardless of how large your brand is, think of four pages, is all you need. You can probably do it on two if you need it to. Start yourself with that why statement. Keep it very short and sharp. Then articulate the what. Get into the how and, and make sure that there is a human face to what you do. Um, if we can package that up and we can make it look beautiful, we'll, we'll have to get to the how to make it look beautiful part in, in another session. But I really, really believe that if you take that as your hymn sheet across your organization, that's really all you need um, to start getting a consistent brand message across. So I think I want to try and pause now. I know questions are tricky, but I am acutely aware that some of these constructs and some of these um, this thinking is, is quite theoretical. I do want to, and you can either um, put your hand up or you can pop it in the chat. I want to pause and just, does anyone have any questions around that at this moment? I'll just pause for a moment and let you either write or you're welcome to put your hand up if you prefer. Okay, let me just check. Can you put up the sheet again? Ah, yes, absolutely. I'm so enjoying being able to see people that I didn't put the content up. That's a very valid question. <laughs> there we go. Okay, I'm going to go from... What I will do, just to recap, if there are no questions, is just go through some of the um, the methodologies again. So let me start here, actually, rather. Very simple structure when we're talking about brand story. Start with the why, then get into the how, then get into the what. You can swap the why and the um, you can swap the how and the what around. It really doesn't matter. No one will know. Um, but make sure it's short and sharp. And then make sure that all of this is done. Let me get myself back. Within the lens of what the competitive and, I, I, again, partner environment is doing. You cannot articulate that story kind of um, just on its own. We have to make sure that we have figured out how we are different. Um, and how we can be more memorable um, than our competitors. So I think I'm going to pause uh, for with that for today. I know it's quite a lot, and I know it can potentially feel quite theoretical. Um, but what I will ask everyone to do is, I know that we've got probably another 15 more minutes and, until the hour's up. Um, 
I will stick around. Um, and I'm also very happy if someone wants to put camera on and ask direct questions, because I think that will be more helpful um, than just kind of more, more theory, more methodologies. Um, what I will also do is just be a little bit cheeky and ask, given that we've got a few moments, if you don't mind, I'm going to put our um, research link in the chat. If you'll take, it should take no more than two minutes, um, five minutes uh, um, of your time, just to give us some insight into what this next module could look like. Because as you can see, branding can go far and wide. Um, the next types of conversations that we could have is all around brand identity, which are the visual components of a brand. Um, we've spoken about brand story now. We can also get into more practical details, which is um, fundraising proposals. How do we develop case for support? How do we get that brand story and translate it into a case for support? There's some beautiful learnings that we've got around how to structure that, um, you know, do we ask for the money up front? Do we tell the story up front? Do we tell it in pictures? Do we use case studies? Do we tell the high level data? Do we go um, kind of talk about an individual story? There's a lot of lessons there. So I think what would be very, very helpful to us is just to understand what, what your marketing needs are. Um, we've got a whole lot of models around social media. Um, we also are very happy to bring in some of the experts who we interface with where they've got some really lovely tools and tricks around, uh, you know, shooting on a on a cell phone and trying to get that kind of of professional some some ideas around social media content um but as always uh we need your insights and we need your input to figure out what's actually going to be be helpful to you so let me keep quiet for a little bit i'll give everyone a moment or two just to fill in the research link um and then i will stick around for the last kind of 10 or so minutes just to answer any direct questions that anyone may have yeah, and just to add, I have made today's session um, an extra 15 minutes uh, longer, just so that it can end at quarter past 11, so that if people do want to jump off at 11, that's fine. But those of you that have questions at the end, you can stick around and Meg will still be there to answer any um, kind of questions you may have, or you might be feeling a bit too shy to ask in front of everybody right now. Brilliant. Hi, Diana. Yes, the link is in the chat. So just above your message, if you look there, um, you'll see there's a type form link there. I don't know if you can see it. Just let me know. We can just repost it again if you, if you can't see it. Remember, guys, this um, link is quite important for to give Megan a bit of insight into planning future sessions. Um, just so that we can be sure that we are actually giving you the content that you need. Uh, we don't want to just give you what we assume you need. We want to actually be sure that we are actually meeting you guys where you actually need to be met when it comes to things around branding. Um, like Megan said, it's not just limited to branding. It's also around fundraising, proposal writing, um, things like your social media, things like, for instance, how to use the, the equipment you have, like she mentioned about like, how to use your cell phones to shoot content, et cetera. So please um, don't don't be shy to kind of give us insights into what you need. Um, if it's something we don't have a, an expert on, expertise on rather, then we'll be able to kind of um, try and find someone for you. But please do go ahead and fill in that survey. Oh, great. There you go. And for those of you that missed the link the first time, Megan just popped it again into the chat. So please just have a look at it there in the chat. It's the latest message in the chat.
Thank you so much for that feedback, Paul. Megan, uh, Paul says he just wants to say it's been really awesome, um, the session. So really great to hear that you're doing some great work there. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. It's good to know. Um, we really we really believe in this idea that the the brands working in the for good space have the opportunity to change the world. Um, but I think in these types of forums, what we're so acutely aware of is I don't just want to throw theory into the abyss, right? Um, we want to know that it it is actually practical, hence the kind of, um, you know, write it on a page, the billboards, some of the methodologies. Um, but yeah, if you can just tell us, point us in the right direction, we are very happy to share whatever whatever is valuable in our heads. Um, We've got a comment here, fundraising and proposal writing and an effective way to share impact stories. Okay, I think that's that's a whole module on its own. Um, and and I think the one thing that I'll say just while we, we're wrapping up here is from a storytelling perspective, one thing to have perhaps think about between now and the next session is just what we are seeing more and more and more um, in the ether today and in the communication channel is this idea of video. And I know video can seem expensive. Um, it requires specialized skill in terms of video editing. But um, if I had two minutes and someone said to me, what could I do? Um, whilst we've seen many, many beautiful case studies that are written, um, I would not spend time crafting lengthy case studies in any way, shape or form. Um, if you can get your hands on any kind of free um, online video editing classes, um, upskill one of your team members, the youngsters in your team, give them a decent um, a decent phone. You don't need fancy equipment. Um, and, and what we'll, we'll do maybe the next time as in line, we'll do the proposal writing and maybe structuring a case for support. Um, but the most impactful thing you can often do is put together these short, sharp videos. Um, so again, just as a, as a while we, we waiting to wrap up, uh, I would urge you to think about how, how that can become a reality in your business. You don't need the Steven Spielbergs and of the world to edit it. It can be very authentic. It can be shot on an iPhone, but go video. That's the way to do it. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. We gave you some more work to do. Now we've got to change all the proposals and approaches. But feedback to us if it works. Ho hopefully it um it has an impact and shifting that conversation to starting on the inside um gets you some gets you some results. Fantastic. Okay, Samo, unless there's anything from your side that you wanted to add, um, I can see the responses coming in from the research. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we promise to look at all of them and make sure that the next session that we are together, Samo will give us details of the dates and the times, that we get even more practical. And I think by the looks of things, we're going to talk proposal um, proposal writing, case for support. Um, and then we can also, um, I'm seeing in the chat, we'll do a crash course in kind of storyboarding and, and how to edit together really impactful case, um, case study videos. Megs, this is a question that's come up a couple of times in the chat mm. is, are we able to share the presentation? I think some people want to maybe look at the presentation that you had today as while they're watching the video again, if they're rewatching. So are Absolutely. we able to actually share the presentation? I will do so. Um, with the videos in, it gets a bit clunky and a bit large. So um, what I might do is for those video components, I'll just, they're just YouTube links. I'll just put the YouTube links into them and then we'll be able to email it across. The rest is nice and, and, and emailable. Perfect. So guys, we will be sharing the video and also the slides that Meg's been using just to run through the sessions. Um, the video will be linked onto the slides as well, so you don't have to worry about you um, trying to find those as well. Um, and I think for today, we are done. I think Meg's done um, everything she's prepared for the day. Remember just to, if you haven't yet, fill in the survey so she can come through next time ready and prepped. But I think we are kind of, based on the responses we've received today, we kind of have a good idea of where we're going, where we're going to be doing um, 
next session, which is around, um, I think it's imp sharing impactful stories, as well as I think it was proposal and fundraising proposals, I think. I can't remember what it was, but yeah, something yeah. along those lines. But yes, and then, let me see. Oh yeah, they're asking if we can share both presentations. So if you can also share the first one from the first, okay. um, first session as well, Migs, because I think some people might have watched it and not necessarily had a chance to interact with that information as yet. So yes, please do also share those. And then I will be sharing um, both presentations that Meg has done last last ones and this one. And also again, for those of, of you who might have missed the link or might have felt a bit overwhelmed to fill it in again, I'll share that as well for you guys so you can give her feedback on what it is that you need training on for the next time. But I think then we've ended nice and early today. So lovely, you guys have got a couple of minutes just to kind of try and catch a breather but yes thank you so much everybody and for those of you who might have questions please stay on the call maybe five more minutes on the call so mm -hmm. that you can be able to ask meg um any questions that you might maybe be a bit shy to ask in front of everybody but everybody wishing you all a great day and a great week ahead thank you everybody thank you for your time we really appreciate it Um, I think if anyone does have a question, because I'm not sure if everybody's still just kind of jumping off the call, if you do have a question, um, I think you can already come on the camera so May can kind of get a sense of how many people um, have a few questions for her. Um, if you're not willing to come on camera, that's also fine. You are also able to just pop it in the chat. We just wanted to be sure that we're not keeping her um, unless she actually does have some questions that some of you guys might want to ask her. Maybe you want to get a bit more insight on something that you might have missed. Um, or ask a question around branding that might not necessarily been covered today, but maybe it's something that has been burning um, that you need to ask. So you can go ahead and ask that. I see Jenny's got her hand up. Jenny, you can go ahead. Hello, um, I'm Jenny from Milk Matters, the Breast Milk Bank. And what I wanted to ask about is I understand the concept of having a look like Nando's where you know it's them and it's used consistent all the way. But what we found was Sometimes when it was too much of a consistent look, um, people were saying, well, it all looks the same. And especially mm -hmm. when we don't have different stories, like Nando's, it will be a different slogan. It will be a different campaign. But ours is always about donor breast milk that is going to premature babies and saving their lives. So we don't have mm -hmm. different, we can come with slightly different angles, but that's the basis for it. So we found, we, we had a marketing company and our, our reach dropped dramatically and we had people saying um, it all looks the same because it would be different, a different wording, mm -hmm. a different picture, but it was similar. So how mm. are there times when having something different, which is what I find works better, is actually acceptable? How do you get the balance between mm. the two? I think what you you probably alluding to is is sort of a campaign mindset versus a brand identity. So so in your case, what I would say is that your brand identity should remain strong. So the logos, the I don't know if you're using illustrations or photography or whatever, whatever those bits are, those visual bits that you're using to craft the brand. Um, your tagline remains consistent, but that doesn't mean that that you you're using the same ad each time. So I suppose your your task is to come up with clever campaigns and clever angles within that. Um, I mean, brainstorming right now. This is probably the worst idea, but this is just this is just shows you how we would start the process. Is like. Um, uh, brands will often then do seasonal campaigns. So if it is about breast milk donation, do you in winter go the, you know, the ag I'm making this up. I don't know what your kind of angle could be. Do you put at the heartstrings? Um, 
Oh, I'm just figuring okay. out. I'm hearing myself talk or someone else. Um, can, can you can you shift that messaging um, and talk to some kind of seasonality? Can you link it to any kind of um, other awareness days? Could you, I'm sure that you've done this, linked it to Mandela Day and said, okay, this is a way for you to do good. So I, th I think it doesn't, these are campaign angles that you're looking for. I don't think the brand should show up completely differently um, from a visual perspective. I, I don't know if that starts to help the question, but I think I think you definitely, a big part of marketing is campaigns and getting very smart around campaigns. But if I, if I looked at all of those campaigns together, they should still feel like your brand, right? Without becoming kind of dull and boring. I don't know if that helps to answer at all. Yeah, uh, yes, it, it's uh, somewhat. It's just difficult yeah. to when it's just babies and limited yeah. pictures of babies because we can't actually take photos of recipient babies. It's difficult to make it not too similar. But yes, it does. It does mm. help. Thank you. I, I would, and again, we're brainstorming, but that's you know that, that that's part of it. Is is maybe you think about angles that aren't just around pictures, like could you have um, an illustration of a milk bottle that says, you know, this many mills makes this much difference. Maybe, maybe you got to start thinking about kind of yeah, infographics we do. We do and do that. data. Yeah. Okay. So you, you, you're going to have to just work within all the elements that you've got. You're going to have to try and animate them. Um, I think it is a tricky one when you've got such your, your problems, almost the opposite. Yours is so single minded, so, so easy to articulate, but it's finding those nuances. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that there are ways to do it. Um, maybe you've also got to think channel. So maybe are there different different ways where you can kind of mix it up and appeal to a broader base? So instead of making the messaging different each time, you're making that circle bigger. Don't know. Don't know if that helps. This is where it becomes, you know, you roll up the sleeves and you try 10 things. Uh, two of them work, eight fail. Then you try another 10 and one works and you slowly start building that pool of, of things that are appropriate for that brand. Thank you very much. Cool. Timothy, I think you had a question. Right, right, right. Hi, hi, how are you? Hey, well, then, you. I'm good, I'm good. So, yeah, my question is based on uh, branding, you know, because I've been, we have been running this organization and we are, well, we are just a youth, you know, it's just youthful organization and pretty much we do not know everything. We just know how to do work. You know, we just work. We, yeah, we don't know much about marketing and all these things we never really cared about. And now we are starting to approach uh, funders and sponsors and all these things. And someone was telling me that we need to, to do branding, you know. So I, I was confused because the person came to me and was like, you need to have a letterhead. And that letterhead has to be constant. It's part of branding. And the colors that are there, the fonts and the page layout, needs to be consistent. So I was I wanted to ask, how do we do these things? Like, like from where do we do it? Because we just use Canva, we create that document and that's it. We never really used uh, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, you know, we just create everything on, on Canva. Mm -hmm. And most of the time we are not constant in what we are doing because I picked up that we need to be constant and reliable and all yeah, the, the things mm -hmm. that you shared. But how do we do we actually do that? That's why I ended up asking for the presentation so that I can just take it, show it to the team and be like, hey guys, there's the presentation. Hope you understand. If you have questions, don't ask me. Go and find me again on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if I'm understanding correctly, Timothy, it, it's a practical question of how how best to make a letterhead so yeah. that the team can use it. Yeah. Um to be very honest, there's not one answer. If if your team's using Canva, fantastic. Um, I'm a good fan of Microsoft Word and PowerPoint. When used properly, will get you a long way. And maybe that can be one of our sessions. It's just kind of really how to um how to use PowerPoint. I mean, all my slides were PowerPoint today. You can keep it really simple and make them make them beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um 
So my short answer, you're probably not going to love it, is the tool, pick a tool and get very good at it. Whether mm -hmm. you pick Word, whether you pick Canva, um, it's more important that that letterhood, letterhead looks the same each time and that your team can use it. So mm -hmm. don't go too fancy. And remember, the reason people want a letterhead isn't, doesn't matter what your font is. Um, it doesn't, for sure, you want your logo to look as good as possible. But mm -hmm. what a letterhead tells the reader is this is a legitimate organization. We're back to this trust thing. They're using all these signals and these clues to say these guys mean business. They know what they're doing. Um, yeah. So if Canva's working for you, cool, mm -hmm. go for it. But make sure everyone uses the same letterhead, that the information's right, um, and that the the style of communication, if I receive something from you and all your team members, it feels like what I would call one brand, one organization. Yeah. So again, don't know, don't know if that helps, but I think um, maybe in your case, an idea is put someone in charge of, of who is responsible for the brand whether it's yourself or you designate a team member and say, okay, guys, let's let's upskill ourselves. Pick Canva, pick Word, pick PowerPoint, doesn't matter. Um, but say, okay, we're going to use the same PowerPoint template every time. We're going to open with the same slides that tell people why we do what we do, just so that things start to feel the same. Um and yeah, we can we can probably do a whole session around how to get really practical and, and make sure those look as good as possible. But mm. again, consistency is more important than one person using blue and green on their Canva template. And then you pluck the logo and then actually I don't love this logo. So I just add a little bit to it and then I get bored of it in six months. Then I decide I'm going to change everything to yellow. That, that's that's when it gets tricky from a brand perspective. No, so okay. no that helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it does, it does, it does. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Nia, yeah. you had a question. Good day. Um, my name is Neo Mungana, and my, I'm from Colosseum Group, and we're into education and training. Now, my question is a very simple one. Um, I want to know when is it the right time to create a website because we've been uh, having this organization for a year and we're not quite sure should we have a website or not because obviously we're using uh, social media to tell our story, uh, uh, to position ourselves as a brand. So, but we are always told or referred to when do you have a website? Do you have, so I, I want to understand the importance of having a website and when is it the right time to do it and also uh, if you can maybe perhaps because I see a lot of hosting sites which maybe if you can maybe suggest if we want to do a website how are uh, the tools or maybe mm. people to the right uh, I don't know how to put it but I think you understand where should we go if we want a, a, legit, a legitimate website thank you yeah <coughs> excuse me um so to answer your first question, website in, in a marketing world. Oh, give me one moment. Um, what we would say these days is what they call proof of life. So sadly, a website, um, it can be so simple, a one, a landing page. It doesn't have to be this huge, big, chunky thing. But I would say that again, remember, if you're thinking like a donor, thinking like who's on the receiving end, even a human being, when when we see a brand that we like the look of, we go onto Google or we tap, we say, hey, Siri, and we, um, oh, now she's just answering me, sorry. Um, we go and we look for that brand. So my short answer is definitely you need a website. I think that shows proof of life. I think it shows that you're a legitimate brand. That does not have to be the most expensive um, uh, kind of bespoke exercise. There are many, we don't use them. Obviously, I acknowledge that we use suppliers who create custom websites. Um, so I need to go and do a little bit of research. But I know Wix, 
Wix is very, very good. There's templates that you can use. Um, I would urge you to just, even if you pay a small subscription fee, go get one where you can actually buy your own URL. Um, so look at Wix. Um, if you want to look at purchasing the actual domain name, so you know the name, the www.findgroupglobal.com in, in our instance, um, go to GoDaddy, GoDaddy.com. Um, they will be able to tell you whether that domain name is available for purchase. Most of them are not pricey at all. A couple of hundred bucks, um, you can go and purchase your own domain name. Um, and then just you will have to look at some of the integrations with some of those template sites. Um, but essentially, then you own that domain, the .com or the .org or the .co.za. So go look at GoDaddy there. And then I'll, I'll go and do a bit of research. Um, but Wix is a good example. Otherwise, um, generally what we build websites on is a thing called WordPress. Um, WordPress is also really, really simple. Um, it is possible to upskill someone in your organization. Lots of templates available. Um, so, for example, it'll almost give you the wireframe and then it'll say, right, put your heading in here, put your brand colors in here, go and put, um, take a JPEG, your image, and you build just a very, very simple landing page. So don't know if that starts to answer your question. Let me go and do a bit of research. I'll happily share it with Samo um, and make sure that she gets it to you. But short, short answer, if you want to be perceived as a legitimate, um, trustworthy brand, I would, I would push for a website in its simplest, um, most kind of elegant form that you can. Hope that helps now. Well, thank you very much. That's informative. Thank you. Thank cool. you, Neil. Yeah, I was going to say, I think he's just popped another question in for you. <laughs> yes, yeah. What's the difference between .org, .co.z? So, again, that's around perception, okay? So, a lot of foundations, a lot of NGOs want the .org because, that again, remember, all these things are signals. I'm giving signals to the receiver mm -hmm. as to who I am and what I do in this world. So a dot org, um, there are some legalities behind it, but you don't have to get into detail, um, is when you want to signify that you are a kind of a foundation in the for good space. The difference between dot co dot za and dot com um, is really just around do you want to be perceived more at a global level? Or do you want to have that feeling of local presence? So if you want people to know, I got my feet on my ground, I'm South African based, I'm, I'm from South Africa for South Africa, go.co.za. Um, if you want to have more that kind of roll off the tongue global feel, you could go.com. Uh, it, it's there's not a one, one uh, you know, kind of one brush we can paint everyone with. Um, so I think very happy to have a discussion if you are, are um, in the process of doing it. It might also have a very practical implication that you go and look that the .com domain is taken, so you land up having to buy .co.za. Um, but I would say, and I don't know enough about your organization, potentially look, look at .org because .org has a really nice feel for it in the NGO space and in the foundation space. And there are some kind of legalities around when you can and can't use .com. Um, so I would say .co.za or .org is probably the better option. But I am I am shooting a little bit blind, so happy to have a separate conversation if we need. Um, and then how how do you run campaigns without sounding desperate? <laughs> that is a very valid question. Um, short answer. Don't start with the problem, start with why you are the solution. Um, so maybe you can help me out. I don't know if you want to just, don't need a camera, but even just a voice, tell me what your organization does. Um, okay. But, oh, has it? Hello. Hi, everybody. So we're from Kutato Foundation. Our organization deals with a feeding scheme and providing groceries for um for grannies around Katlehong. And then we also 
an institution whereby we provide tutoring programs for students and we are slowly branching into um, supporting um, high school students with mental health issues. And the reason why I'm asking how do you then run campaigns without sounding desperate is because as an NGO, most campaigns, they normally, people are sad on the campaign and how do you still keep professionalism and not sound desperate, but still um, sending out the point to people that, okay, we need support for our organization? Mm. No, I mean, this is this is the reality of the dance that we have to do, particularly in this for good space. Um, but I will I will stick to my same principles of, of frame why you are the solution. Don't don't belabor the problem. So, for example, and I'm making all these numbers up and I'm making it up entirely. But if you're about feeding scheme and grocery groceries, you know, we can talk about tutoring and mental health separately, your communication or maybe your framing of your campaign is, um, you know, uh, you can articulate the need. You know, we have X number of families in our community. Um, they are relying on us for X many meals a day, but we have fed over x number of people um for only 20 rand it feeds this many families for this long and i'm making up all these numbers but i'm trying to i'm trying to give us some structures um show why you could be the solution if you engage with us did do you know um that 5000 rand equals feeding this many families for a month 10000 rand we can reach this many um package what you do did you know that our tutoring program, um, and I'm making this all up, but for X amount of rand, if you go into a corporate, X amount of rand gets these kind of components. Um, you know, we can pay three tutors for three afternoons a week for uh, X amount of money. Um, so, so show them what you're doing. Show them that you're really smart with the funds that you've got, and then almost package and productize if you give me this much i can do double if you you know what i mean so you almost make make it more kind of a um i don't want to say mathematical formula but you know what i mean you you productizing and packaging what you do and then you're saying hey be be really clear if you give me this much i can go this much further or say um we are launching our mental health making this all up, so kind of go with it. We're launching our mental health program. We have a goal to reach 10 schools in 10 months, okay? What we need to get to that is X number of rands a month to support this many mental health um, or counsellors, whatever those components are. So you're not just saying, hey, how much have you got? Can you help us out? You're getting really, really specific around what you've done with what you've got and then even put numbers and even if you have to ballpark them right even if you don't know exactly just just round it off or get or say you know approximately five thousand rand equals this many meals um um in order to get this many mental health um support resources into this many schools i need that much so you get really really specific and uh, that's that's how I would frame it at a at a kind of ask level, so a case for support or fundraising proposal level, and then always couple that with a with a some kind of story, and video by far. I mean, if you had um you interviewed a gogo who was getting the groceries and get her to say how many children she's feeding and what this does, you need a minute, a minute and a half of that, coupled with a very clear, well-articulated ask around what you're going to do, how you're going to steward those funds. Uh, 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 that's where I would start. Don't know if that helps. No, it does um, actually help. Thank you so much. And cool. a question that I also had is, how do you prevent your domain from being um, from being cloned? Because I've seen that people can actually clone your domain if you have a, 
a dot org they can create a dot co dot za and then reroute people into that dot co dot za mm-hmm. instead of your own domain i've seen that fraudulent being done especially in websites how do we then prevent that because one of the big things about being an ngo is you need to be legit as possible and everything needs to be um yeah legitimize as possible how do we prevent that because if i take this domain and then the fraud fraud start takes another domain and they start advertising uh requesting for donations using my company name and they have a professional website how do we prevent that Mm-hmm. I mean, practically speaking, if it's not too expensive, buy the domains. Go on to GoDaddy um, and go and buy .org, .com, .co, .za. Um, buy all the iterations. If that gets pricey, um, then to be very honest, I mean, that's a hard. It's a hard one to say how not to do it. Um, I think the best thing that you can do when it happens communicate very quickly onto your social channels. You'll see a lot of people will, you know, you'll put out a social post very quickly, say, please be aware, fraudsters. Um, so, yeah, not not an easy answer, but if possible, buy them so that no one else can take them. And if that is too costly, you're going to have to just be super vigilant um, and get really proactive in your crisis management if and when it does unfortunately happen. Thank you so much. Oh. I'm just reading here. Quizzy, hi, we offer web services and marketing campaign building for NGOs. Well, there we go. We have some some support in the midst <laughs> yeah. of us. Fabulous. I was also going to say, I don't know if you saw, there's a question that Oli had added on to um, uh, Nomzama's question, which was, how do you follow up with Art Sounding Desperate? I think that will be, have to be our last question, guys, because I see we are over time. So I think it's around um, around the campaign. So how do you ask for things with Art Sounding Desperate? And then the next question would be, how do you follow up then with those set <laughs> um, funders without yeah. sounding too desperate um, to be like, what's going on? I've sent the proposal through. How do you do that without sounding too desperate? Oh, wish that was an easy answer. Um, I think it's a fine balance because I think, um, you, yeah, I, I know that this is a very actually competitive environment that we all are seeking our little um, kind of piece of the pie and piece of the funds. Um, again, just approach everything with professionalism. Um so make your biz- make your emails and your responses feel business like that you be, be the thing you want to be in the world right assume that they are missing out on an opportunity this is how i always do it because i'm actually not great intuitively asking for money I, 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 it, it, I can do branding i can make the pitch decks but actually asking is hard for me so i always in my mind approach it when i'm writing those follow up mails I imagine that they're missing out on an incredible opportunity because they are actually every single person on this call does incredible work and people should want to want to fund us. Right. So I almost write with that view, not arrogance, um, but just following up. We understand we, we have a phenomenal cause a uh, reminder of the good work that we're doing. We, we're gaining great traction, um, but as always, we need your support. I'd just like to follow up. Can we get some time? Can we come and showcase some of the good work that we're doing? Can we show you some of our monitoring and evaluation reports where we show how we are the better or the best stewards of this money? So you try all different angles. I do, again, just don't fall into the trap of going, the need is so great. It's going to be like, you know, the world is ending. Quickly help us. Just just frame it in that way of, gosh, look at this fabulous work we're doing. I want to share it with you. Do you want to be part of it? I know it's hard and I know the, the doors close a lot, but just go go with that mindset. That's honestly my very practical opinion of, of how I, I do it. And it's hard. It's the hardest thing. So I don't, if it gets easy, let me know because I'm, I've been at it for 15 years and it still feels hard. 
Max, I think we'll have to wrap up for today. I see we've already gone five minutes over time. I know you've also got other commitments today, but I just wanted to thank everybody who's still on the call. We really do appreciate it. And what we'll do is we'll try and have another Q&A session at the end of next um, next mm. month's session so that we can actually, if you have those burning questions, if things do come up during the month that maybe you didn't think about right now, um, that you might want to ask Meg, then we can give it a chance, just a go um, at the end. Um, and then Louise, just another comment from Louise Meggs, just to say the longer you go, the more we realize how incredible your knowledge is for us. So everybody's just really, really grateful for you being able to share this knowledge. I think, like I mentioned last time, even for myself, it's just it's been such a great eye opener um, because I'm not a branding expert either. And so it's just sitting in on these lessons has just been so great. So just a big thank you from our side as well and from our courses um, and to all of our courses. Thank you again for being able to join today. We look forward to having you again at the next session when Megan comes through. Um, wishing all of you guys a fantastic day further. Megs, as always, thank you so much for all your help. Absolute pleasure. We'll see you in the next round. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you, guys. Ciao. Bye. Bye.